Okay, so uh, I am Brian Cardell, and uh, the topic for today's chat is temporal, which is a new standard way in ECMAScript to deal with time, which we'll talk about. Time and standards uh, make their way into a lot of my talks and posts. I talk frequently about standardization and how the idea, the modern idea of standards bodies and everything is kind of young and modern forces that were born largely in like industrialization sort of force the issue. Now, it's surprising to me how much of this is rooted in time actually. So I think that we have a sort of perfect group to talk about not only like temporal, but like a lot of the reasoning and the standard story and everything behind it. So I'm here with some guests. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, uh, I'm Maggie Johnson Pint. I brought the the original temporal proposal to to update the date object in JavaScript in 2017. On top of that, I, I am a uh, technically a maintainer of Moment.js, though I think everyone knows now it's pretty much a winding down project. And for my regular job, I'm a uh, product lead on the Azure SDK. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, I'm Philip Cominto. Uh, I work at Egalia on the compilers team, uh, where we do things like uh, participate in, in standards processes, like, for example, Temporal. So I joined working on Temporal about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and I've been part of the group that's uh, sort of made the decisions that allowed it to get to stage three in, uh, in TC39 in the standardization process. Hi, I'm Pip Dunkel. I work for Bloomberg in JavaScript infrastructure. And I got involved in Temporal, what, two, three years back now, uh, by raising my hand at the wrong moment when it came to let's try this out in a polyfill and have been driving it forward ever since. That's very true. That's exactly what happened. I remember. <laughs> Does anybody want to give me like a, a summary or if you want, maybe I can give a summary of what is temporal? Temporal is a set of actually multiple uh, objects or types that represent the problem domain of date and time very well. It makes sure to bring in um, a much better time zone support story for JavaScript. It allows us to more clearly express in our code what we're trying to do with date and time operations. Basically, JavaScript a date as a, as a thing was introduced sort of as a as an afterthought, and basically it's just a copy of Java util date, right? And Java util date wasn't all that great to begin with. Um, there are a whole bunch of issues with it. So, for one thing, the concept of dates containing time is questionable because most people think of a date as just a, a day, right? You think of your birth date, birth date not of as a time point, but rather as a day, right? And then you think of time separately from that, and then you can combine them and have date times. And so it's a much more complex um, field than just a class like date, right? And that's only, and that's not even looking at the complexities yet in terms of cultures, because date in the US, yeah, Java util date is fine. But then add time zones to that. Then add cultures that actually don't use our proleptic Gregorian calendar as a standard. And then look at the C world that is basically just working in seconds since epoch of whatever that system thinks it's epoch. And so dates have never been a good thing in any computing, right? So I don't think there's a computing language out there right now that has good dates and times and, and handling of that that is actually consistent. And becoming more global through web apps and not just local, be it the US market or be it the Western market or whatever, has really forced web application developers and web developers specifically to worry about how do I represent dates? How do I represent times? And that's when Moment came along, right? At, at, to, to fill that niche. And Temporal is really the logical conclusion of all the things we've learned. A perfect example of where I just really got angry yesterday was... I am an Austrian citizen and I got and I live in the UK and I've gotten a letter yesterday from the Austrian embassy and it was using because it was written in English 
uh, month, day, year as the date format, but it was unrecognizable as such because it was July 8th. So is it July 8th or August 7th? Which one is it? And you don't know. And you can't even tell from the context because the context would be this is the UK, the the embassy in the UK sending in, sending a letter, right? Why they would use a, a month, day, year format, who knows? And that kind of thing has never really been well represented in any computing across borders and not even within borders, really. So temporal is sort of the the attempt to take all the learning of all the things that came before, including well, Moment.js and the concept of web apps being transnational and transcultural, and the attempt to actually give dates and times not just short shrift like in the past, but make them actual first-class, well-supported things. And me personally, I think that after Temporal, JavaScript will be the go-to language for anything having to do with date sometimes. I was a user of Java Util Date at the time. And it, it takes this really sort of naive thinking, which is natural, right? Like it's natural to think like time is, well, it, it's just like this counter that keeps going. Like it's this very linear thing. And what you're doing is referring to some point in it. Um, and we then have different degrees of granularity. Is it a day? Is it a month? Is it a year? Like that's very simple. But then as you start to dig into it, it, it obviously gets much more complicated. And when you try to do things, it's sort of terrible. And so even in Java, the original date library was pretty quickly deprecated. And I know there's a whole site about this. Uh, your calendar fallacy is dot com. Maggie wrote an excellent piece at the start of this talking about some of the history. And Maggie was also on Moment, which like it was much better than date. Maggie, I don't know if you like, can you tell the story of any of that? Sure. Certainly there are some things that Moment improved greatly about date. Like you can add in Moment. <laughs> like like on the date object, you have to do like set day plus day plus one to, to add a day or something like, like it was wild. So, so moment fix some things like that um, in a really good way. It's a date. If you use day, it'll turn out wrong. That's another problem with the object. I still screw it up. So, so moment fix some things like that. Um, it certainly gives you some better convenience APIs, but there are a few things that we really couldn't fix in moment. I think the fundamental concept that you were getting at, Brian, that that people need to understand about date libraries and working with with date and time and programming. I always say that there's a, a, a difference between like timeline math on the global timeline and calendar math. And those are two like very conceptually different things. If you're working in units of I generally say hours or less, and there's a caveat here around leap seconds, but if you're working in units of hours or less and you're working with actual points in time um, that like you can map to UTC, right? Like we all got on this call, we're all in different places, you know, um, but we all picked the same point in time in UTC to get on this call. Then we would figure out one hour later by moving along UTC, right? Like by moving along the global timeline. And that's, that's one kind of math. But if we want to figure out like on a given day in the calendar, what a month from now is, that's actually an entirely different kind of math. The way you're going to do that is not by moving along the UTC timeline. You're going to do that by like almost imagining you're flipping through the pages of a calendar because obviously like not all months are the same length and stuff like that. So one of the like kind of best things about breaking apart into multiple types and multiple objects is that we can create kind of distinct um, calendar math objects that are separate from our timeline math objects, which is a huge advantage that we didn't have with the original date object. Some other like really fundamental problems, there was no like time zones just weren't exposed. There was no exposure through through the language, through the browser, through JavaScript of time zone data for anywhere other than where you currently are and UTC, which is this huge. I mean, there's a huge amount of use cases you can't cover. And you see a million people complaining, well, I had to loan all of these time zones for a moment time zone and now my bundle size is huge. And it's like, well, yeah, 
it is. So, so we needed to solve that. And then the other really, the, the other two really fundamental issues with date, mutability. The object would mutate when you when you uh, did operations on it, like an ad or something like that. And and we carried that through into Moment and absolutely we could have fixed that in user land. But at a certain point with the other problems around time zones and around kind of needing to break up the type system, it, it made more sense to like pursue standardization than to pursue a, you know, Moment 3. Um, though we kind of did that too with Luxon. We kind of did both. And then the last thing is that I'm sure everyone knows that the date dot parse behavior the the date parse behavior when you pass a string into date is like wild it does not do what anyone would expect it it makes some really odd compromises it made some really really odd compromises between es5 and and es6 as you want to call it so there's just there was a lot of stuff that was like time for a do-over what a lot of people don't see is like the pains that people had with moment and the pains that the maintainers had with moment and i'm not sure how many people realized that there was like this kind of moment three thing that you're talking about. Um, I'm not sure how many people realized that or that it was like basically the same moment people saying like, we got some things wrong. Sure. So that was Luxon. Yeah. And the question is, um, why go invent a new thing to standardize moment three or just standardize moment, right? Um, Like I have been asked that like really directly in the same way that we were asked, like, why didn't you just standardize jQuery? So I don't know if you want to respond to that. I feel like you did a pretty good job explaining it, but if you want to add anything, now would be a good time. You already heard what I said about, you know, actually this domain is more complex than one type. You want to be able to represent timeline math separate from calendar math. You know, uh, Philip was talking earlier about you want to represent days separate, separate from time. These are all different concepts. And as you introduce them into code, it creates a lot of clarity in the code for the future reader about what is it that you're really trying to achieve here. And, and I think that's really valuable for people. But also as far as why not just standardized moment, I guess a few other things that I'll, I'll throw in. Trends, trends across languages. Uh, you see Java breaking out into the kind of um, type system that we're bringing in, in moment with, with multiple types. Um, Python and Ruby also use kind of split multiple types. It's not exactly the same. Um, .NET 6, uh, my husband literally just introduced uh, date and time to .NET 6. We're both nerds, um, but but he, he did the uh, code contribution for that in .NET 6, and that's coming out soon. So there's some general ecosystem migration to these multi-type systems that, you know, allow people to kind of bring that conceptual model across um, platforms. But also, we saw with Moment the mistakes when you didn't have that. We saw, you know, the number of GitHub issues and Stack Overflow issues where we're just answering the same thing over and over again because the API really doesn't provide that clarity to the user motivated us in this direction. And and at the same time, you know, we shipped Luxon, which I think many people use now. Um, and that was that was Isaac. He's he's a maintainer of Moment. If you look closely, it's in the Moment GitHub org. <laughs> and that was our sort of answer in user land for people who wanted something now, and also for people who don't like this this big broken out type system and, and like the kind of single object. Isaac trends closer to that in his coding patterns there. The other oh, the last thing that I think is important why we didn't I think why we went to standards. It's not why we didn't standardize Moment's API exactly, but why we went to standards is just it was so big. People kept telling us it was big, and 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 they're like, you have to tree shake this, and we're like, you don't know, understand. We use that code. <laughs> you can't you can't tree shake out code you use. There probably were things we could have done to reduce the bundle size, but like in practice, none of them were easy. So I wonder if how many people listening are like doing the date math in their head and saying, okay, that was 2017, now it's 2021, and it's finally made it to stage three. Only recently, geez, what takes so long. But uh, that that's pretty fast on the standards timeline, actually. That's not exceptionally long. Yeah, actually, I think that in that context, it's actually fairly important to realize that the standards part of it, which started 2017, is only really the last chapter, right? So if you think about it, the whole thing developed from a community need for proper date and time handling. And that means the first attempt at this really is moment, right? With one and two, and then the ideas of Luxon 
and then at the same time going into the standards body and then taking some of the some of the things that Luxon does and all of the learnings that Moment has done and all of the experience that that people have built up over years and years and years and then bring that as a proposal to the standards body and then create a polyfill for people to play with and do first things with and then publish that and and get that feedback and really so if you think about it that way right you say the standard for standards work this isn't really all that long which is right 2017 to now isn't all that long in standards work but if you take the whole body of work right from the moment moment start moment jazz started right till now i would consider that the incubation period for this proposal so i always say the temporal really is the grandson of moment right and if you look at it that way then it's a huge very lengthy standardization process where we've basically taken the beaten path and taken all the learnings we've had uh, and applied them to what we finally put into the language and all the feedback that's been gathered through those multiple years. So I think that's probably the better way to think of it. I think there's a, a good question here that will get lost to history, maybe if we don't talk about it, which is what is in stage three currently as of right now? How similar is it to the original proposal that you wrote on a train? The basic idea that we were going to have the split type system is certainly still there. I believe that we developed at that time some of the patterns for passing um, object property bags, I believe, are still there. But a lot of it is quite different. You know, there was there was definitely this this kind of point in time where, admittedly, I had taken a lot of plane rides to a lot of standards committee meetings and I was kind of done and Philip was was willing to do it and, and I was willing to let him. <laughs> So I think at this point he should he should kind of pick up the story from from there. Okay, I guess then I'll pick up that story. It's actually surprisingly similar. What's changed is the volume. So from that initial proposal which basically did that split between working along a UTC timeline versus working in dates and times as date math and time math. Uh, we've also added representations for common things like think of a birthday, which consists of a month and a day because it repeats every year, right? Or things like year months, which is like what is when if you want to refer to February 2000, right? The February 2000 meeting of something where you know the you know the month and the year it's supposed to take place, but you don't have exact dates yet. Like think of how you would schedule a future TC39 meeting, right? You know what year, you know what month, but you have no day, no idea about the day yet, right? So that was added. And then what also came to it was not just time zones as as a factor, but we realized that actually calendars are just as important, that there's a large part of the world out there that doesn't work with January through December. They work in completely different calendars and they only use, if at all, the Gregorian calendar for computing. So examples of that would be basically the entire Muslim world works off different versions of different Islamic calendars. That's what all dates and times in official uh in official statements are put as that's what you know holidays are defined by then there's the uh the hebrew calendar which is which is relevant for uh for all the jewish holidays then there is the japanese calendar which is in use in japan itself and they only really use the Gregorian calendar when they interact with the Western world or in computing because there isn't a good ex alternative and so on. Um, there's a Hindu calendar, there's a Chinese calendar, there are calendars all over the place that are actually in daily use for people and they only really use the Gregorian calendar because there is no computing alternative. So that's another big add to that proposal. But other than that, it's actually... I think fairly similar to 
the temporal as I got to know it um, in, what was it, 2018, I think. Still no Mars. Still no Mars. <laughs> that was my favorite question ever in a TC39 meeting. Like, Maggie, we're supposed to colonize Mars soon. Will this object be able to support that? But you can do Mars. That's the nice thing, right? We designed it flexibly enough so that you can actually do Mars if you want it. But I was going to say another thing that I, I think was added maybe halfway through the process was temporal duration and all of the uh, facilities there for like, taking a length of time and, and say rounding it to the nearest week or something or, or you know getting a getting a length of time and then getting the total in in nanoseconds. Those are all things that that are new in the in the year that I've been involved with this. And Moment has some of those I think at other. You know, other daytime libraries have uh, have some of those, but yeah, there are some really interesting things you can do with durations, like you know, round it around a duration to the nearest month relative to the start date in a particular calendar. Yeah, so there are several things that I, I think are really cool and interesting about temporal. One is that it is kind of a significant add of a rare sort to JavaScript. To like, it's a whole standard library for time effectively <laughs> ads of that sort are very rare like uh intel is its own whole committee right then ecmascript the standards committee for tc39 is in charge of the, the core language but internationalization has like its whole own ecma 402 and it is a large ad we have very few sort of top level objects that are rich with their own apis like math or Intel. Yeah, and it's actually one that intersects with temporal enormously because, as I said, you know, different cultures interacting with dates and times and calendars and time zones differently. And all of that multiplied really by the number of cultures that internationalization supports. So we've actually been working very closely with ECMA 402. And there's a lot of overlap with ECMA 402 to get Temporal done. I think it's worth noting that everyone wanted this one. Like, you go to a TC39 meeting and on any given proposal, people are going to feel many different ways, right? There's a lot of people in the room. And I don't remember anyone ever being like, we shouldn't fix date functionality. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's yeah. one of the most universally liked proposals. <laughs> Not that everybody agreed on the approach, right? But it's one of the most universally liked concepts. And I think that's what let us get such a big proposal through at the end of the day. Absolutely. I mean, even since we've re reached stage three, I think I've had like 10 different groups of people come at me, both from inside Bloomberg as well as from outside, sort of asking, so when is this actually going to hit browser? So, you know, I really want to use this. This is like... Uh, we're waiting for just this. So the enthusiasm, both in the community as well as in the companies, as well as in the committee, is definitely there for it. Temporal is is quite large as JavaScript proposals go. This means that, like, if you're if you're reading a proposal for something smaller, like I don't know, the knowledge coalescing operator, you know, it's it's quite easy to you know look at the README for that proposal and understand what it does. Temporal is huge, and and so it allowed us to take the opportunity to you know not just write the specification text in the proposal, but also you know give people a polyfill to try out and write API documentation. Yeah, this is actually the when I said there's a couple of things that I really liked, I thought was really interesting. The other one was this. One of the biggest ways that standardization has evolved over the years is increasing sort of the touch points of how we can involve and who we involve in the process. And while I would argue that it's still in many ways like very imperfect and we're still figuring it out, I really like when we are able to create some kind of polyfill or something that really lowers the barrier for developers to get a sense, like a real sense without volumes of explainers and, you know, wading through GitHub issues and reading minutes and everything. A lot of things about standards operate on a time frame that developers cannot possibly be involved in. But if you give them a thing and say, uh, this is pretty much the thing, uh, you can ask questions on it. You can maybe even try it and like try to do a useful thing with it that might be beneficial that you, you could choose another solution, but you can try this one and give us some feedback. So I really like that we did that. And can we talk a little bit about like that we got feedback and if and how that shaped anything? Yeah, sure. So th this is something 
that we worked on mainly starting last summer after most of the, you know, most of the questions about, you know, what do we want the API to do this or that had been worked out. You know, at that point, you know, at one point we just drew a line under it and said, this is ready uh, to publicize more widely to get feedback. So what we did was uh, write a couple of blog posts and spread them around. And, uh, and I wrote a survey, a sort of developer survey, you know, and what we did was publicize in, on Twitter and in other channels, uh, you know, asking people to try out you know, writing some simple code with the polyfill and then, and then do the survey and let us know what they thought. So we actually got quite a lot of responses on that survey. So it's, you know, it's, it's like Maggie said, people have been awaiting this. They're eager to try it. They want to see it. So th there were actually a lot of people who, you know, who obligingly tried out the polyfill and, and filled out the survey. And I think the, probably the most important piece of feedback that we got from the survey that showed up the most consistently was that people said, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of keystrokes to, uh, to do uh, to do things in general, you know the uh, the API is very verbose because at that time there was a lot of uh, like if you wanted to add a month you had to add like you know temporal dot duration dot from months one, um, and so like obviously every everything that everybody says in a survey uh, is not necessarily something that you can implement like just as they want. You sort of have to take the feedback, interpret it, and synthesize it into something that's, um, you know, that you can act on. Uh, but when, when something so shows up so consistently uh, where people said, well, I really wish that it was shorter. <laughs> so many people said that. Then that was that was a clear signal like, to go back and examine uh, what could we do to make operations shorter. So, you know, and that's that's kind of what we did. We elided a lot of those those from operations that, uh, uh, that were necessary at that time and made them unnecessary. Like people had a lot of suggestions for what to make shorter and we didn't necessarily take all of those because sometimes there was a good reason to have you know an explicit step somewhere for that but we, we sort of took a look at the whole proposal and tried to identify any areas where you know where it could be made more concise the code that you would write with it I, I think that that really led to a lot of improvements throughout the API just through this this feedback that uh, that, that things were too long yeah I mean the example that you mentioned is that for a lot of input you can actually just input, your value as an ISO 8601 string, right? And that came straight out of the, oh, this is so lengthy and you need so many froms. So a lot of, most of the functions now accept a string variant that's in, as long as it's an ISO 8601 format is acceptable as input, right? That's, that's an example of what came directly out of that, out of that survey saying, make things shorter. Yeah. And I think that one of the people that actually gave the highest quality feedback and the most thoughtful input based on, I think it was that survey or was it the polyfill before that, then actually joined the core group of people working on this, this is Justin Grant. Uh, we invited him to collaborate because his feedback and his input was actually really thoughtful and really, really valuable. So... That we said, you know, yeah, I know you don't work for one of the member companies and aren't a delegate, but come on, your input is actually helpful. So let's go, right? So I think from that perspective, that survey opened a lot of doors. Yeah, I think that there's like many different kinds of things that you get out of that. So one is like finding new people who can like participate in a really high quality way directly in making it better. Another is... Like, are there general things across the board that we can look at and maybe improve? And and here is a good example of where maybe some of that happened. But like another one is finding out the things that are people are going to have a reaction to, but they are the way that they are. And it, it is like an important thing to prepare for how you explain it, right? So uh, sometimes a thing has to be a way for a specific reason. And it's maybe not like what a lot of people would intuit or choose and being prepared to explain why it is that way before you come out <laughs> is actually pretty helpful i think because like what happens with a lot of things is that everybody kind of plus ones that feedback and you you get lost in a sort of you know defense of it so even if you can't sort of like fix it uh you can at least be prepared to explain why it is. And like maybe an example of this is... Um... Time zones and calendars are both cases where that's the case. Because most people that comment from the Western world, they don't see a reason why we should have calendars. It's a perfect example for that. 
And we need to be able to, and we are able to stand up and say, actually, that's a very limited view. And once you do add calendars, that means you automatically have consequences from that that might make other things slightly different. Temporal.now, all of the functions that give you information about the uh, the environment that you're running in, like the current time or the current date or the current the, the time zone that the uh, user has set their computer to, they're all collected in this in this one temporal.now object. That that's another thing that people gave feedback about. It's like why, you know, how come to get the current date you just you don't just say, you know, temporal new temporal.plain date with no arguments. It's a this, there is actually a reason why all of these functions uh, that, that give you this information about the current state of things that they are in this, they're contained in this separate object. And this is, uh, this has been a requirement since pretty early on in the proposal. Maybe. The reason for that is SES, right? So there are secure environments concerns because whenever you, whenever you expose information about the environment, you open up for fingerprinting and for security concerns. So in environments where JavaScript is used that do have even higher security concerns, where you want to basically hide all system information and make sure that system information is only available in a controlled channel, you need to be able to do that. And if you make the constructor with no arguments, take the current time, you have no way to basically say, actually, you aren't supposed to have access to the current time. How do you do that? So that, that's the reason why it was always considered we need to put this into a separate place that uh, secure environments can just remove. It's been requested for, since uh, like almost the beginning of the proposal that we separate those things out. So is it like almost fair to say that there's sort of like almost two proposals there's sort of like a proposal within a proposal when it comes to temporal like one that's the core language feature and then there's like how it works in a browser that has access to yeah like, a lot more i wouldn't say that would you i would actually <laughs> okay because there's uh like in the proposal text there's there's a whole section of you know things that that only apply if uh you know that apply to the intel environment so you know there there are JavaScript environments that you know that support this ECMA four hundred two standard with, uh, for internationalization, and there are JavaScript environments that don't. And so there's a whole section where if you are a JavaScript engine that doesn't have any of that, then this whole section doesn't apply to you. Right? I, I, I yeah, I, I think that I think it's fair to say that there are uh, there are sort of two levels here. There are a lot of different concerns when it comes to the language as a whole, right? Uh, there are security specialists in there that uh, that are looking at create a secure environment. Then there are browsers which are looking at, okay, how do we do this in a browser? What do we have to ship? Uh, and so on, right? Then there are environments like, um, if you think Node.js on the server, which has different concerns than it does on a browser. Then there are engines like Modable, which uh, that are basically have all the language in ROM and are intended to be used on, on IoT devices. Uh, how do you make sure that this doesn't kill uh, that kind of engine, right? So there are a lot of different concerns that you actually need to address and get in that aren't as clearly apparent if you're coming at it from the perspective of, I'm a web developer, right? And I'm using JavaScript on a daily basis, but they are still very important. So, uh, you know, the example that you gave, Modable, where everything has to fit in ROM, I actually don't know if they support internationalization, but I'm assuming not. So, you know, if, you're, if your engine doesn't support internationalization, then, you know, there's only one time zone and one calendar in, uh, in Temporal. Uh, whereas if you're a browser... That's actually, I, I think it's finer slice than that. Because even if you don't support full internationalization, that cuts off all the string formatting stuff, but you can still provide multiple time zones even if you want to, even if you don't supply uh, full international string formatting. So from that perspective, you could say there are five or six levels of proposals uh, with access to local data, with no access to local data, with string formatting, without it, 
with time zones from where and with standard calendars from where and so and most of this is dependent on the environment that you're that you're in so yeah from that perspective you could say they're multiple so one of the things that we haven't talked about yet what i think would be interesting to cover in the last few minutes is you know when we're when we're talking about what's happening in ecma you know ecma didn't invent time <laughs> um like they didn't invent calendars or time zones or any of that and like maggie was saying earlier like if you want to get any of that right in moment it involves like some pretty large bundles and things like that and so I was wondering if like somebody could talk about like the other standards and like, I guess, sort of like how some of this works and how do we how do we even do that or know that? Well, for one thing, we're deferring a lot of things, right? So, for example, for all string formatting, we are referring to the ISO 8601 standard, right? So we are, didn't come up with us with a string format. We use that. And then we use the enhancements there. And actually, um, Ujwal from Egalia went the whole way and made an RFC proposal to add the additional things we needed to that standard, right? And then for time zones, we're not saying, okay, we're now specifying time zones and please include them. We're deferring that to the Unicode Consortium Um with uh, with IANA time zones, right? Uh, and leaving that up to, again, something else. So that holds true for most of the proposal is that we're trying to incorporate the rest of the world as much as possible. It's one thing to have words written down in a standard, in an ISO standard, but, you know, lots of things have to deal with this and it's very, very complex. Um, who maintains this? <laughs> who maintains time zones? Uh, there's... there's... <laughs> There's a database, which is actually a, you know, a collection of text files in a particular format that uh, contain every known rule for when you go to daylight savings time, and, or sorry, daylight saving time, uh, and when you don't, uh, you know, when you go back to standard time in, in every time zone. And, you know, all of the current rules, all of the historical rules, and you know, these text files, they're uh, they're consumed by many different pieces of software, and you know all you know, there's all different pieces of uh, software that compile these text files into uh, you know more compact binary representations or or whatever. It's worth noting that the IANA database is maintained not by computing people per se, but by academics, who are historians typically. And then they get a lot of industry input. But the only reason I note that is that the text files themselves are worth a read. If you go read the raw text file, you'll see things like this time zone changed due to the Nazi invasion of Germany in World War II, and when, <laughs> at which point they, like, they're really quite fascinating. Uh, but anyways, keep going, Philip. I just wanted to call out that if anybody wants a little interesting history trip, it's in the flat files. Wait, while we're, while we're on this topic, like I also have a, a sort of fun thing about this, which is to circle, put a sort of bookend my intro about history and things like before the industrial revolution in America, at least um, in everywhere else in the world, I would assume more or less is the same. Like every town basically had their own time zone. <laughs> it was just sun time, right? Like solar noon, you would have a timekeeper and like that was your time. And you can actually see uh, these records in like the Library of Congress and things where uh, it would be a different time in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I live and New York, which is uh, very nearby and currently in the same time zone. And like whether they respected daylight savings time or not, I guess, was a decision that was up to everybody. Like trains kind of changed this because suddenly you could move faster than the sun and now that became sort of a problem because people missed their trains. Everybody was confused. Um, and so when you say all the historical data is in there, like it, it is actually like phenomenally complex history. And it's very, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a fa fascinating story with that, that, that I actually got from the IANA database files, which is in 1786 or somewhere about then, uh, the London time zone changed by seven minutes. Well, that's because the Navy, uh, the Royal Navy, moved from Richmond in West London to Greenwich in East London. 
which makes a seven minutes difference in, in the meridian, right? And so from then on, London changed by seven minutes, which is in that, in that um, database file, which I think is, makes for really, really interesting uh, cases. Or I hate the year uh, 1970, right? Because in 1970, it, which is the epoch year, so it's a classic one for testing. Well, that hit me because in 1970, Britain didn't have daylight savings time. They gave it a year off. Uh, same during World War II. They, you know, went to daylight savings, but never went back. And the next year they went to another daylight savings and never back. And in the end, they were three hours different from where they should have been. And only after the war did they go back. That kind of thing is all over that database. And it's really fascinating reading. So I can highly recommend go into those plain text files and have some fun. These are databases that are in text files. And then we have like different systems that build and use those and deploy them. And they have all sorts of different deployment strategies and update timelines and things like that. And uh, Philip works on our compilers team and does implementation work. And um, I was wondering if you could. Yeah, sure. Um... <clears throat> So, you know, a lot of the environments, you know, where Temporal is going to be implemented in, they, you know, a lot of these environments are already have some sort of time zone database available to them because, you know, like a browser, you know, already has time zone information, it already has some connection to, you know, the, 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 the raw database with these text files because it already knows about time zones in some form or other. So, you know, not necessarily that this information is that you can directly call this information up through some sort of API, you know, but if you're, if you're implementing temporal in a browser, then you do have access to that information. It, yeah. It would be really prohibitive if, if we, um, you know, recompiled uh, the, the time zone database uh, into our own format, just to use in temporal, we'd use, you know, we'd use what's already there, which is, you know, it generally goes through the ICU library, which also provides a way to calculate with calendars. There's a PSA I got to slip in here. If you are a government official considering changing your time zone rules, there's a solid four to six month lead time for the database to pick that up and to be able to roll it out to all computers. Don't decide two weeks ahead of time. Governments sometimes do that and it does not work out. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Anybody on the listening who might be a government <laughs> yes, official. Yes, <laughs> please. Thank you. So um, we are just about out of time. Everybody, thanks so much for um, spending time with me here and talking about this. I think it's like super interesting, very exciting. And I really enjoyed talking to you all. If you, uh, I guess on the closing, I would like to, uh, extend a couple of thanks. The proposal wouldn't be here if not for someone we haven't mentioned yet, which is Brian Turleson, who's been a, uh, ECMA rep at Microsoft forever. He met me when I had first joined Microsoft and was like, you're going to fix time, Maggie. And he was like very convicted about it. So my, my closing note is I want to give a shout out to Brian Turleson for, for doing a lot, actually, to get this started, to help me get it started. And then the other person I, I do want to thank is, is uh, Philip on the call for keeping it going when I got a little tired of the travel. <laughs> so. I think for my uh, closing words, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention the, uh, the most hilarious response that we got to the feedback survey, which was somebody who filled out every question with the response. JavaScript is kind of cringe. Why are you doing this? <laughs> that gave me a good laugh. Yeah, and, and and on that note, I'll take over the shout outs uh, because there are a lot of people that have actually been involved in this uh, over time that have made major contributions. I'm thinking, as I mentioned earlier, Justin Grant, who came back with great feedback and very thoughtful comments on that we recruited from the community. Then Shane Carr from Google, who's been our interface to ECMA 402, who's been involved. And then basically everybody that has been badgered by me or some of the other champions over, over the years for, oh, we need this from you. Can you give us an answer? Is this okay for you? From the SES community, from Apple, from Mozilla, from, I mean... Th this is a proposal of, of a scale that it really involves a lot of people in a lot of companies spending 
spending a significant amount of time to move us forward. And I think now is a good time to give them all a shout out. So basically, thank you everybody for tolerating uh, the badgering that we've done over the years and helping us out where you could. Yeah, I guess on the note of saying thanks to people, uh, I would say that if you haven't listened to any of our other podcasts, like a lot of the recent topics that we've been doing have been about the health of the web ecosystem. And so they have been a lot also about like who invests and what they invest and why they invest in this giant commons that makes everything about modern life possible. And um, so I would like to say thank you to everybody who has invested anything in this and just give like a special shout out to Bloomberg on this actually, because there are someone that you know isn't a microsoft or a google and uh they contribute a lot to the commons so thank you for that yeah and on that note uh the person i forgot that i shouldn't forget because he's involved in everything and has over the years kept me sane and been a guiding guiding light is little dan dan ehrenberg again he's been of enormous help in in the temporal context as well so thank you to egalia for being great partners in this.